Palestine. Then they made a secret treaty with the French, and they promised that they'd give the French Palestine. And then they promised to give, through the Balfour Declaration, the Jews Palestine. And they'd given Palestine to three different groups. And suddenly Frederick Howe realized they don't believe in treaties at all. It's all been for nothing. All these people have died. This carnage, this horror. I mean, you talk about warfare. I mean, the, what happened on the Western Front and the, the bayonet charges, the trench warfare. Four bloody, horrible years. If you've ever read into the stories of the people who were there, horrible, horrible, horrible carnage. It's all been for nothing. And so Frederick Howe said, what was it really all about? And so Frederick Howe thought, well, it has to do with economic imperialism. Maybe it had to do with commercial interests so that the British would be able, commercial interests would have a better trading advantage over the Germans. Maybe that was what it was about. And then he said that a group of men came to him. They were known as Lord Milner's men, and he named them. Uh, they were the men who surrounded the Prime Minister at that time. This is 1919. The Prime Minister of England is Lloyd George. And, and they said to Frederick Howe, you know, we've got to get you to join with us to create this world government. This is the, what it's all about. And, and he said, you know, they didn't even know the meaning of the term economic imperialism. And they told him the war had nothing to do with economic imperialism. It had to do with a white man's burden to rule the world. The white man has to rule the world. That's our obligation. That's our destiny. And that's why the war had to be fought to its conclusion. Because without that, they wouldn't have destroyed the existing social structure of Europe. It's all their confessions of a reformer. But of course, you're never going to hear most of these things uh, from Ted Koppel or Dan Rather or Barbara Walters. Well, then you have one other person who will attest to what this is really all about. Admiral Chester Ward. Ward. Uh, Admiral Ward is quoted in Barry Goldwater's excellent book. Actually, we have the quotation in here, or you can get it from Kissinger on the Couch, which Chester Ward wrote with Phyllis Schlafly. And uh, Admiral Ward, 16 years in the Council on Foreign Relations, finally came out and said, look, he said, uh, this is what it's all about. There is a small clique within this organization that is totally dedicated to the destruction of, of national sovereignty, and they're totally dedicated to world government. And of course, he felt this was terrible. He was a man, a member of the military, a judge advocate general of the Navy, uh, who really believed in America's independent state. He realized the Council on Foreign Relations was being used to program people to support this internationalist dream for the Parliament of Man, the Federation of the World. So how then does this all tie together? Well, Monsieur Perrault, as he was looking at all of the, the suspects, realized that in, in, the, in the dead man's body there were 12 stab wounds, and there were 12 suspects, every one of whom had a motive to kill the American. And he said, there are too many clues, 12 stab wounds, 12 people, all with a motive. Well, as we look at what's going on in the world today, how do we begin to put this together? And so let's just take what Professor Quigley has told us about the origins of the Council on Foreign Relations, and let's go back to Cecil John Rhodes. Who was he really? What motivated Cecil John Rhodes? And what most people do not understand is Cecil Rhodes had entered the Masonic Lodge. She had sworn the oaths of fidelity to the light. Now, how many of you here, well, I won't ask that, because probably most of you know what the light is in masonry. But the first, if you go into the Blue Lodge of Masonry, the first thing you do is they blindfold you, they put a noose around your neck, they bare your chest here, and then they roll up your pant leg, and then they march you up before the worshipful master, and they say, what do you most want? And you're told you're supposed to say the light. So you say the light. And, uh, then you go into the second level of the lodge, and they say, um, what do you most want? And uh, you're supposed to say, more light. And then the third level of the lodge, why you want even more light. But you never know what the light is. Nobody ever tells you. In fact, you're told as you go up to the levels of the lodge that they're going to tell you the secret. The trouble is that they never tell you the secret. You may catch a glimpse of this as you read the esoteric writings of masonry, but most people within the Masonic Lodge are intentionally deceived. And if you read Morals and Dogma, why, and written by uh, Albert Pike, he will tell you, we intentionally deceive people coming into the Lodge. 
Why? Because we don't want them to know. Most of them are not worthy to know the real secret. If you read Manley Hall, now uh, Albert Pike died in 1891. Uh, during the 20th century, the leading Masonic philosopher is a man named Manley P. Hall. In fact, he had his headquarters right down here in the Los Angeles area. I don't know if you know of it, but Manley P. Hall had written extensively on Masonry before he ever joined uh, the Lodge became a 33rd degree Mason, one of the leading Masonic philosophers. And, and he said, Masonry is a fraternity within a fraternity. Most Masons are wonderful people. They have a good time. They do good things. But there is an inner fraternity dedicated to the mystery, to the secrets. And of course, Manley Hall wrote extensively on what those secrets were. And of course, unless you understand those secrets, you can't understand what energized Cecil John Rhodes, or why the symbol is on the back of the American dollar bill. What does that symbol really stand for? What does it really mean? And why is nobody concerned that that symbol is on the back of the dollar bill? Well, first of all, you can read what the occultists will tell you. They will tell you that the pyramid has to do with uh, pagan rites. And in pagan rites for the last five to 6,000 years, the pyramid has been the symbol. It's got 13 steps on it. It has nothing to do with 13 colonies. 13 is a s secret uh, occult uh, number that gives tremendous power. Uh, the term above, uh, which I can't pronounce, but it has to do with he favors our venture, the Novus Oris Seclorum, has to do with a new social order, the new order of the ages. 1776, they will tell you, has to do with the date when America was created, and the all-seeing eye above is the eye of the God, of the sun, the eye of light. Well, Cecil Rhodes, after going and entering the Masonic Lodge and hearing the lecture by John Ruskin, suddenly became consumed with this idea that it was his destiny to create a one-world government. Now, we knew he'd never lived to see it come to pass, but he believed that he would form the foundation for this one world government. And he began then to recruit men to his cause. You remember there were three men initially. There was William Stead, and there was Lord Escher, his name was Brett, and there was Lord Melvin. Stead was a, an occultist. He was a member of the Theosophical Organization. He was deeply involved in spiritualism. Why was he in, interested in getting into an organization with Cecil Rhodes because occultists, and you read occult writings, they will all tell you we're moving towards a new age, we're moving towards a new one world government, we're moving towards a new spirituality. If you read the material which we have, read Carol Quigley's book, read uh, uh, the pages from uh, White's book, actually taken from Stead's diary, um, you'll find out that the second level of the secret society was a man named Lord Balfour, Arthur Balfour. And Arthur Balfour had formed the Society for Psychical Research. And Professor Quigley tells us in his book, The Anglo-American Establishment, that the men who joined with Milner after Cecil Rhodes' death primarily came from the Society for Psychical Research. They were all into the occult. And this is the common denominator behind everything that's going on. If you go into the Council on Foreign Relations today, you'll be amazed to find how many of these men are into the Lucius Trust, are into theosophy, are into masonry, and the underlying focus of everything that's going on today is occultism working within every one of these organizations. Now, most people think communism is an atheistic form of philosophy. In other words, Karl Marx was an atheist. He talked about religion being the opiate of the masses then most people are usually incredibly naive. Karl Marx was a Satanist. And if you haven't read the book, Marx and Satan by Reverend Warren Brown, who spent 14 years in a communist prison, you have to, and, and we carry that through our, through our ministry. And Marx and Putin and Bakunin, who were the three leading socialists at that time, were all into Satanism, and they embraced socialism as a means of destroying Christian civilization, Western civilization. That's what it was really all about. Mikhail Gorbachev today is a new ager. You go to his State of the Union, uh, State of the uh, World Forums in San Francisco or down in Mexico, and the whole thing is occultism. And what does Mikhail Gorbachev talk about? What we need is a one world order, a new world order, and a new world spirituality. At the recent conference that was held in 
um, in Rio de Janeiro. It was called the uh, Earth Summit Plus Five or 